think you uh, have a sense of the esteem which this room holds for you. The NMC Fellows Award is, is our highest honor. And as Gavin noted, we don't give it out every year. We only give it to truly exceptional people. The work that you've done in every aspect of your life has touched so many people, has made them think so deeply. Thank you. Have a seat. Thank you. Middle chair, please. So, uh, we're going to now go to questions, and we've got a couple that we'll start with, but we'll have mics running around the room. I've had the good fortune for the last couple of days that I've got to be in many conversations with David. He's been so generous with his time. He spent time with the emerging leaders, and in every single conversation, we left feeling just like you feel right now. So, get those questions ready. Gavin? Uh, yeah, so we've got, a, as Larry has said, we've got a couple of microphones going around. Um, ah, I see one at the back there. Is anybody carrying it? Just while we're doing that, while we're setting this up. Could you run mics? We're nearly there. While we're setting this up, Larry. Yes. I know you have a question. I have today. a question that uh, is really a follow-up to the comments I just made. The thing that is absolutely clear when I think about what I know about your life and your career is that you bring a deep passion to what you do. Tell us a little about that aspect, how you approach things. Well, I think several things. Uh, I made clear that I, my academic career was, was laughable, really. Uh, and I went to school, I went to work at uh, 16, I uh, realized what was missing from my life and discovered to my absolute amazement that I loved learning. I'd left school being told not only that I was stupid, but that I was unteachable. And I discovered that I really, really loved learning. I think what made a difference was, obviously, I was going to night school and I was able to construct my own curriculum and focus in on things that interested me and, which, and things that I felt connected. Um, and as a, I, you know, if I'm absolutely honest, there's a little bit of anger, a tinge of anger in, in there. Um, but I was... Uh, Denied an early start. Now, we were very lucky. Patsy and I were at school together. We got married very early on and uh, focused on our lives. I had an absolutely inspirational father who, it, worth mentioning, despite my lamentable uh, academic thing, never, ever doubted me. I never, ever had my dad beat up on me at all. It wasn't that he necessarily blamed the school, but he certainly thought that uh, over time I might, I might be okay. In fact, the only very sad thing, I mentioned this once at BAFTA, the only very sad thing that ever happened in my life was my dad died just uh, two months before I won the Oscar. And that was, a, that was a, a bit of a wrench. But otherwise, we've had a, a fantastic life. So passion. It's because I know better than anyone else in the world how fortunate I've been and how lucky I've been and how many breaks I've had. I think my passion stems from wanting to try and ensure, and several people from this platform have said this, try to ensure that the fortune, good fortunes that followed me is at least available to other, as many young people as possible. You shouldn't have to be lucky in life. You should actually, it should be enough to be diligent, decent, hardworking, committed, loving, compassionate. That ought to be enough to organize a decent life for you. Unfortunately, we, don't, we haven't reached that point yet. Uh, BJ was saying this last night at dinner. We haven't reached that point. So my passion, yeah, is to try and extend opportunities to as many people as possible. I'll finish with one tiny thing on this. When I entered the film industry, but more by luck than my judgment, uh, in 1969, um, it was entirely nepotistic. Frankly, if your dad or your uncle wasn't in the film industry, it was very, very unlikely you'd get in either. And it was clear to me this was wrong. There was a Labour government in power at the time, and again, by lots of good fortune, I was able to join the, be an initial trustee of the then recently formed National Film, became National Film and Television School. And we set out for the very first time to try to break this grip, this nepotistic grip on the industry. And to my amazement, within very few years, we succeeded. It was quite extraordinary. It was uh, one of those things, once you really started pushing at, at it, it, uh, it wasn't easy to get it to fall because we had very, very bright kids coming in, proving they were bright, and going out and getting great jobs. 
And surprise, surprise, they didn't have an uncle in the industry or a dad in the industry. They were just damn good at what they did. So I think I'm constantly, each time when I get a bit depressed or something happens that allows me to believe that actually you push a bit harder, shove a bit harder, scream a bit louder, and things and things do happen. I think that's what keeps the passion going. Thank you. That was brilliant. Now, could you uh, indicate if you have a question? There's one there at the back on the left. Thank you for an incredible, incredible talk. Um, we human beings, um, unlike any other species, seem to be good at making technology, and then technology tends to remake us. Uh, and that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, the only problem is that the, the wheel of technology is, is spinning faster and faster, and the young ones seems to take to it like fish to water, and the older ones uh, don't. So there seems to be uh, an acceleration of penetration of technology, uh, and yet the older ones are entrusted with teaching the younger ones. How do you see in your mind uh, this seemingly uh, trying to catch up and, and the distance keeps getting wider and wider all the time? Do you have ideas as to how those who are entrusted to teach the young, who can't really catch up with the technology anymore, how do you do, go about putting two and two together anymore? I think it's, it's, a, it's a very helpful question. I think there are two issues. One is, I think we haven't, we people who, we believe as we in this room, haven't been as good as we might be at getting the mainstream media on our side. I think we are, are often defeated by the fact that the, the media have a default position. The default position is playing to the fear that often accompanies new technologies and, and the fear that accompanies change. And I think we've allowed the media, in a sense, to get away with that. Yes, of course, most decent uh, newspapers and indeed television channels have a technology person. But how often are they on? It's, if you're lucky, it's two pieces a week in a newspaper and one half-hour show a week on, on, on television. So when you actually look at how, I mean, Keith put it brilliantly, when you look at how important these changes are, when you look at how lamentable, really, I have to say, if you told me 20 years ago and I started out in this, over 20 years ago, with Stephen Heppel and Ken Robinson, people like that, if you told any of us how little we would have achieved in the 20 years, I think we, would have, we wouldn't have believed you. We would have been shocked. Uh, and I do think that we've, we've failed to capture the imagination of the mainstream media. They don't see it as a challenge. And I quite deliberately, rather crudely, if you said, if you like, use the military analogy. It seems to me that only with extraordinary things, when there's 60,000 casualties on the first day of the song in the British Army, do they wake up and say, you know what, maybe we got this wrong. Well, there must be a way of doing it without 60,000 people having to die before anyone wakes up. And there's a job to be done. And this one, I'm, A, I'm thrilled with this in every sense. We talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, Vince Cerf and Mr. Eagleburger, I feel that I'm very dizzy looking down from these shoulders. The, the, um, we've got to find a way of coming out of our, out of our box and, and mainstreaming our views. This is the one critical thing I, I'm going to say. I ran Gavin knows, a future lab for 10 years, and I regard it, we've talked about this years, in, in a sense, not the success I ever dreamt it might be. Why? Why? Because we hired brilliant people, educational researchers mostly, brilliant people. But we would also constantly talk about scale, going to scale. And when, I, when we got a great little project that was working in three schools or two schools or maybe a district of schools, as soon as you said, that's really great. Now, in the UK, we've got 27,000 schools. As soon as you said, that's really great. Now, what about the other 26,900? You actually watched the cloud cross their face. It's not what they wanted to do. They really wanted to get on with their next project. And they were really looking for funding for that next three schools or that next small school district. So the idea of going to scale was, I not going to say anathema to them. It wasn't of great interest. And I used to recognize this in the, in the movie industry, you know, there was people who regarded themselves as auteurs. And the auteur person would come up with a really maybe a great idea for a movie. Then you say, well, actually, it's great, but unfortunately, it's going to cost $20 million to do it. And it's such a tiny idea. Do you think we could do this or that with it? And the auteur, as often as not, just wasn't comfortable making, and I'm being careful with my words here, because I know I'm, <laughs> um, wasn't comfortable making the, the concessions the compromises, better word, uh, the compromises necessary to find an audience for that $20 million movie. <coughs> so then you've got two choices. Do you, make, do you try and make a version of that movie for half a million dollars and no one's going to lose too much money and there's no fine? 
Well, that doesn't work, uh, that doesn't work either, because that idea, we're back to ideas, the idea at the core of that film may be a really, really important idea. So you actually need that filmmaker to find a way of getting that message out and making those compromises and getting it out there to a bigger audience. And that's how you move things along. Now, in the case of the film industry, I'd say very largely, uh, the industry's going through a bad time at the moment. It sort of seems to have slightly given up on the idea of taking serious, difficult ideas and finding large audiences with them. That'll come out. It'll come around again, I'm sure. So the point I'm trying to make is the education world itself has got to grab hold of the notion that our responsibility is to scale difficult problems and take them to scale. We can't hide behind, uh, we can't hide behind our research grant. We can't behind, hide behind our, our beautifully constructed little project. We're actually going to find out how to, work, how to get to scale. The last thing I'll say on this is something has happened in the last two, three years, which I find exhilarating. And I would never have project, predict, predicted this a few years ago. And that is the, the signing up on these very, very large website, resource websites of teachers talking to teachers, teachers busting past the district superintendent, busting past their own head teacher, and actually beginning to talk to each other about what works. I've got this idea, have you tried this? I streamed this down and I've got, this is really exciting. Now what's amazing is I work with just one of them, um, or two of them actually. Uh, one of them, by the end of next week, will have 2.8 million signed up teachers talking to each other in 140 countries about lesson plans and ideas. I could never have predicted that that would happen. And that possibly is where serious transformation will begin to occur. Now, our job, Larry, I'm going to say, our job is help that, stimulate it, give it some shape, if you like. Make sure that um, these, these teachers incidentally are already beginning to uh, accredit the, uh, what they do and, and, and be, make judgments of each other's work. But it's a very, very exciting thing that's taking place. Uh, and anyway, these are the things that keep me awake at night. Thank you, Dick. I'm not sure. Next question. Okay. Question from Carlos. Carlos. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, I get to interact with hundreds of teachers every year, mostly from Latin America, and I find there's a gap between the older generation and the new generation. The old generation of teachers you can talk to them, with them, about culture, history, fabrics, um, tradition. You know, they're the kind of people you want to spend an afternoon having tea and having a nice conversation with them. The new generation, they are full of enthusiasm, but they're all about skills, techniques, and technology. It's like they run after skills, not content, not knowledge. So I find that it, it worries me. You know, you cannot talk to the new generation of teachers, in most cases, at least the ones I interact with, of knowledge outside the curriculum. You bring a philosophist that is not, a philosopher who's not in the curriculum, they don't know about him. They've never heard about him. So that worries me, that big gap. The old generation of teachers, they, they, were, they, they chased knowledge. The new generation now chased like skills and whatever is in the curriculum. What can we do about it? Well, I think the first thing, I mean, actually, I'm glad you asked because it helps me get past the rather jet-lagged answer I just offered uh, just now. Uh, there are a number of issues. Number one, who's driving the agenda? What's happened is, as educationalists, and I regard myself as an educationist, I'm very proud to, I think we're in danger of handing the, um, the initiative over to um, the business and industrial sector. Uh, that they, they feel we've run out of ideas and they're prepared to pick up and run with it. That certainly isn't an answer. But the key answer to your question is, is again, it's back to a movie analogy where I'm obviously comfortable. You've got to avoid getting into this either or situation. Even in, implicit in your question is that these two polar opposites. There's, this, there's the wise, uh, older, classic uh, Harvard, Harvard, MIT professor who you can sit in the study with and, and talk about the world. And there's this other meritocratic, if like technologically focused teacher with whom you can't discuss the world, but you can discuss uh, how, how to move on in, in, in technological terms. It can't be like that. And it's our job to make sure it isn't like that. That technologically focused teacher has just going to have to be wiser and have a better, a more broad, a broader hinterland. That's vital. The, 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 the older professor needs to uh, read wired and understand what's going on in the rest of the world. 
And you know, I used to confront this all the time in the movie industry, uh, in the sense that you're either going to make an art film or a commercial success. That's bullshit. The job, my job as a filmmaker, was to somehow have a great idea that was full of integrity and then turn it into an accessible, commercially successful movie. That's my job. I've been paid by a studio to try and find an audience. I'm being paid as it were, and then I have a duty to myself to make sure I'm proud of the result. I wasn't always proud of the result, but at least I was tried to be. So I, I just, I reject in a sense the dichotomy that's implicit in your question. Because if that's true, we have a serious problem. I don't actually accept it's true. I think there's, what you're talking about is two different forms of education that needs to take place. You need the, the, what you refer to as the older generation have just got to get real and understand that there are other ways of communicating with people that in some senses might be better, or in many cases, better than what they're doing. But I'm very unhappy at the idea of a technologically focused generation of teachers who have no hint of that. That is catastrophic. And if we go down that route, we really are handing the future of education to the businessman and the other, and, and other forms of financial determinist. And that is lethal. If we go down that route, what will happen is the values of education will vanish and we will cease to be who we are, for sure. The values will become value propositions. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> now, anyone else a question uh, in the middle? Uh, Keith has come one. Keith. Uh, come forward to Keith. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It was a very, very provocative um, talk there. Uh, I guess, I guess I would think that the the record industry and the newspaper industry would certainly relate to the machine guns mowing down their their old war horses. And to the extent that in the midst of these revolutions, the old structures are are destroyed before the new ones are in place. And I think that we can look historically at ways in which what emerges is often worse than what we started from. Um, I mean, I think you touched on this when it came to agenda setting, but uh, the question as to how to ensure that what we're building actually achieves these desires, especially in the face of moves like the iBook only being available on iOS devices and Murdoch investing directly in wireless generation. Um, I guess I'm wondering to what extent uh, our conversation ought to be informed by, say, recent ones in journalism, where initially there was a uh, a push towards citizen journalism solving all our problems, and while I admire the DIY ed and edupunk efforts, like to what extent do we need to forge certain kinds of alliances to actually set the agenda ourselves, and what agenda do we need to be setting? Well, I think um, it's it's interesting. I mean, you mentioned the Murdoch thing. One of the things that's riveted me uh, for the last several months in London is the Leveson inquiry into press, uh, in, into phone hacking specifically. The most encouraging thing for us as educationists, and I don't like default solutions, but the most encouraging thing is that business always will overplay its hand. So whilst we might feel for a moment that, business has got, uh, that the skills agenda and the business agenda somehow has got a grip of the things that we value, sooner or later they'll overplay the hand and it will return to some form, I think, of, of a value-based uh, proposition. But... Um, I think it's. Uh, I think this is going to be a long and very, very difficult uh, journey. And my biggest concern, uh, I was fascinated by the question that Larry was asking uh, each person present this morning about how optimistic they are. I'm kind of. I'm optimistic, but with one overriding concern. I'm concerned that the democratic processes that we, in the, certainly in Europe, my country, value and that are valued here, may not be up to the task that's confronting us. And at some point, people might start agitating for different solutions, which will not necessarily be democratic. And that's very, very scary. I, for the first time in my life, I'm not sure that whoever wins in this country in, in November is going to change very much. I don't actually, I can no longer imagine something really altering. What I can imagine is a crisis of sufficient magnitude that things are forced to change. And that's very dangerous territory. And that's where we, we, have to really hold our nerve. We, will ne we as a group will never be more important than when that crisis occurs, which politicians cannot confront or don't know how to confront and stay in office. That moment, we become very important people because we're the communicators with the generation that's going to have to deal with and clear up that mess. So on the one hand, I'm optimistic because every time I meet like the, the six people I've met here, the young, the young people I've met here, every time I confront young people, my work with UNICEF was the most encouraging thing I've ever been involved in my life, not just in terms of the, the victims UNICEF looks after, but the quality of the people who work at UNICEF, sensational. 
But I do. I am very, very, very concerned that we have a, that we have a robust enough democratic process that can that can hold the line. You know, that, I can't even remember who the original quote was from. Will the will the centre hold? Will the centre hold? I'm not sure anymore, and that frightens me. And if it doesn't, then we become the most important important people on the planet. No small responsibility. Uh, one question over here, and but this is probably going to be the last question. And I think Keith oh, had one. Up. So okay, one question. So um, it seems to me that in education we may be the only area in which the consumer has no voice. We talk about reforming education at the public policy area. We talk about reforming it within the practice itself, but seldom do we actually listen to the student voice and give the students the power to tell us what education should be, should mean to them, and how they would like that to happen. And so your movie tie and your machine gun tie brought to mind a 1969 film by Lindsay Anderson called If. What could we do to empower the students to take control of their own education, to teach us how to teach them? Well, it's both a simple and a complicated answer. The simple answer is listen to them. I thought, I hope in my text, which available to anyone that wants it, I made it very clear that less we learn to listen to them, unless we get better at listening to them, unless we get to a point where we can actually view the world through their eyes, we're likely to make horrible mistakes. So we, that, that's, that, it, it starts there. Secondly, um, I mentioned the whole business of uh, assessment. It's a, a longer subject for maybe for another time, but the, pro the instant the fact we now have the technology that can supply levels of assessment never previously thought possible. And the notion that that assessment can be fed back to parents intelligently, and, 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 and but, but fed back to parents. So I don't agree that the consumer is being disempowered by education, uh, but I think it's it requires enormous guts. Uh, I'm 15 years ago when I came to this world within government, it was almost unimaginable that uh, to ask ahead to ensure that the parents all understood on a daily basis how well the kids were doing. It was unimaginable. Today, not only is it imaginable, it's technologically possible. And I believe that is empowering the consumer, because the parent is a very important component in all this. As we know, it's not just the student. The parent is very, very important. Uh, I'm not sure we will... There's a point at which, frankly, the parent is possibly more important than the student. It, it, one very, very important juncture. Where if you can't hold the parent in, you've got a, a, a serious problem. So I think that... Um, I think that technology, odd, interestingly, is going to supply answers that we hadn't previously thought possible. I think it requires a huge level of trust, <coughs> a huge level of trust, a lot of trust, and it requires, I said, I said I think it three times in my text, it requires a generation of extraordinarily confident as well as competent teachers. Yeah, just a tiny little I I example, well, it's actually two worth, worth using from, from schools. One of the most encouraging things I saw early on was in primary, particularly in primary, was watching young teachers, there was young teachers, having the guts to say to a kid in the front row, Johnny, come up and help me with this. You're so much better at the technology than I am. It didn't have to be true. In fact, in many, many cases, it wasn't true. But you see a six-year-old come up and do something technologically. What's the reaction of the other six-year-olds? If he can do it, why can't they? They expect the teacher to be able to do it. But if one of their peer group can do it, that's different. But that requires... that. If you go back 20, 30 years, no teacher, I, I don't know, I don't, never went to a teacher training college. I doubt very much at teacher training college that a teachers, a young teacher, were encouraged to demonstrate their lack of ability to their class. <laughs> Quite the opposite. They were taught to fake, uh, you know, super confident. So that was one. Another tiny little example. I opened a new school very recently in the northeast, uh, a, a, a beautiful school with more don't want to be happy. No more apple kit than you could shake a stick out. It was, in, it, was in, it was incredible. And I'm going around, and I went to a, a class, 16-year-old English class, a, a, a class of 16-year-old English uh, students doing English. And the teacher explained to me that I mean, she was doing the war poets. I'm not obsessed by the First World War, and actually it's a coincidence. Uh, she was doing, they were doing the war poets, and they were teaching um, uh, Sassoon and, and, and others. And she said, you'll be interested to know what we're doing here. We're teaching the war poets, in terms of their poems, we also showed them Saving Private Ryan. And we also are playing them Joan Baez and Bob Dylan songs of the 60s and asking them to compare and contrast these different forms of protest. And I said that's right. She said, you'd be pleased to know they found Saving Private Ryan the most effective and compelling of the, of the options. 
I said, that's really, really great. I said, um, have you thought about stripping the soundtrack off of Saving Private Ryan and trying it with the Bob Dylan song over it or one of the poems over it or better still, get one of the kids to do one of their own poems over, the, uh, over Saving Private Ryan? She said, no, I, I, that's great. She said, I would never be allowed to do that. Uh, I'd never have to, you know, that'd be a whole series of rights problems and all sorts of dramas. I, I, I couldn't do that. I said, well, it's really tragic because that's what they're going to do when they go home. That's a mashup. They will go home and do that. So you just unfortunately missed an opportunity, not your fault, you missed an opportunity to turn a learning opportunity, uh, there was a learning opportunity, which, uh, uh, you know, they would say, they'll go home and do it. And I'm glad I've raised this quite deliberately, actually. One of the things we've got to get our heads around and deal with, and Larry, again, I'm afraid the responsibility devolves to you, we've got to get a grip of this IP situation. Uh, I'm a founder member of the Creative Commons. I've been involved in this for a long time. We've got to get a grip. I, my dream is that classrooms become IP-free zones completely. Thank you. And it's not, and it's not just a, a sort of silly dream. I think it would be good for the, I think be good for the owners of the intellectual copyright. I think it would get people to respect copyright. At the moment, young people do not respect copyright because they don't understand copyright. And no one goes out of their way to actually encourage them to understand copyright. One of the things I've been encouraging British schools to do is get kids to create their own piece of copyright and see how they feel when someone else in the class rips it off. Because you'd be surprised the kind of lively conversation you can, you, you can get with, <laughs> with, with micro payments sort or of something. So what, these are the battles we have to address. Coming back to the question I answered so badly, I'm afraid, there's the media issue about battle to, to address. There's the IP battle to address. But most of all, there's the battle to address which says to politicians, unless we get this right, Guys, watch Vietnam zoom past us in 2050, because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Now, so those are the three battles. There's a, there's a political battle, there's a media battle, there's an IP battle. If we can win all those three, then I begin to join uh, Larry in feeling a lot more optimistic about the future. Excellent. And a final question from Keith. Is this on? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I hope you have the answer to this, because one of the big problems that we have in the United States is around our teacher colleges. And um, hopefully you figured this out in the UK or somewhere else in the world. But I was, as we, at least in K-12, look at what's coming in, teachers are comfortable with personal use of technology, but not with pedagogical use. And the, the technology ghetto of the campus is the College of Education. I'm kind of curious out of this audience, how many are from colleges of education? Not the majority. So how do we get the, these folks who are in campuses, who walk across the campus to schools of education? Do you have some sort of a model that's worked in the UK? Um, I suppose that the, well, the, 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 model, the, the best model that works, the model that is working and being expanded in the UK is the Teach America model, which became Teach First in the UK and is now being adopted uh, in other places. That, that is a model that's at least getting, uh, getting some serious traction. I would suggest, and it's not, again, this, I'm going to sound very naive saying this, but I, I, I feel it very strongly. I suggest that in a university environment, every single graduate, every graduate in every discipline should spend, should spend some point dipping into the education department. Because I think they'd learn a lot from the education department, and I think the education department would learn a lot from them. So I would, one immediate, rather glib answer, honestly, Keith, is more cross-fertilization and a greater understanding of, on the part of other departments of how important, fundam not just important, how fundamental the education department is to their futures, as well as, as, well as their own, but the future of their discipline. So uh, I think it, it amazes me and I said it there, didn't I, in my speech, it amazes me that anyone would for one moment believe that a teacher could leave, could graduate at 21, 22, and not be reassessed 30 years later, and that somehow their competence would go unquestioned. It absolutely, I find it mind-boggling. Now, I feel that if, the, if you did put in process uh, a constant, as I say, a constant re-evaluation, a constant process of, 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 uh, of assessment, maybe everything would change because the universities themselves maybe would be the places where, t where returning teachers would be coming back in. I'm thinking on my, on my bottom here, I, feel, I was going to say my feet, but I'm thinking, uh, <laughs> where the idea of returning teachers coming back in after five years and after 10 years, bringing classroom practice back into the um, education department, doing three months work and then going back out, that might be an extremely fertile 
and you and I should discuss this. That might be a very, very fertile way of beginning to stimulate something new and new and interesting. That's great. That's great. I'd, I'd just like to I'd end with a question of my own. Absolutely. Like, <laughs> well, it's really a reveal, I think. Um, and, uh, yesterday, we uh, meeting the emerging leaders, we had a little discussion around recognizing people doing their best. Uh, and I wondered if you'd like to elaborate on that discussion. Yeah, yes, it, it came from... Uh, I, I, had a, 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 I was at war for about six months with the IOC over the... Um, uh, Don's laughing, he was there, over the London Olympics, because I thought London Olympics, this is with my UNICEF hat on, I thought London Olympics represented this fantastic opportunity to do a massive fundraiser for kids through sport. IOC not only didn't like that, they hated the idea, and, my, and it, it, it died a death. It's now been revived and, it, and something that may, may happen. But I, in parallel to that, I was working on another thing, which I thought was kind of, could happen, which was the idea of a fourth plinth at the Olympic Games. My fourth plinth would be reserved for the person in each discipline, whatever the discipline might be, in each discipline, who had improved on their own personal best by the greatest amount. Okay. So that there are any number of people, I'm a very full moment of the London Olympics, it's only a couple, less than two months away, there can be any number of people who will arrive with no chance whatsoever of a gold, silver or bronze medal, but who can perform out of their skins and who deserve to be recognised. Because actually, we all know, that's what life's really about. Now, I'm one of the few people in this room dull enough and boring enough to have read Baron de Corbetin's memoirs. <laughs> uh, I do not recommend them. I really don't. <laughs> but it is absolutely evident to me that the, the noble Baron had exactly this in mind. He did not conceive of the Olympic Games as gold, silver, medal ceremony chasing. He didn't ever conceive of a medal table that illustrated that Nation X was infinitely better than Nation Y. What I think he might have been improved, in, in, intrigued by is a medal table that showed which country's athletes had performed the best against their own previous personal best. That's interesting, because that tends to tell you which countries you should start looking at, which countries would seem to have the right processes in place, and, uh, and who knows, might become very, very important in the future. So this notion of the fourth, uh, the fourth plinth, whilst I'll get nowhere at all with the IOC themselves, is beginning to get a little bit of interest from interesting enough advertisers and media outlets and everything else that, that the notion of the personal best is something we should cling to. And it's a nice way of finishing because actually <clears throat> every one of us in this room, you asked the very first question, every one in this room, that's all we're about, isn't it? Is trying to deal with a generation and urging their personal best out of them. If we do that, just that, we will have succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. So this is a nice visible way of of making it aspirational and possible. You've been very, very patient. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. That's it.